Okay. So, we continue with our uh, preliminaries regarding linear vector spaces. Uh, I would like to introduce the idea today of uh, the basis set in a linear vector space. For that you need two concepts. One is that of linear independence and I say a vector is linearly independent of another set of vectors if the former cannot be written as a linear combination of the latter. Okay. So, if uh, um, phi 1 phi r are linearly independent, linearly independent if uh, a 1 phi 1 plus etcetera plus a r phi r equal to 0 if this equation if the equation implies that a 1 equal to 0 equal to a 2 equal to, equal to a r. If the only way you can satisfy this uh, linear equation is with all 0 coefficients then you say that this set of vectors is linearly independent okay. and it is a crucial concept in linear vector spaces that of linear independence. If such an equation has a solution with non-zero coefficients then you say there are linear relations between these vectors and some of them are linearly dependent on the others. Okay. In particular if you have just two vectors then it implies that one vector a 1 phi 1 plus a 2 phi 2 equal to 0 implies that phi 1 is some scalar multiple of phi 2 minus a 2 over a 1 times phi 2. In other words, in geometrical language, you would say the two vectors are in the same direction, along the same direction. Okay. So that is the first concept. The second thing you need in order to define concepts such as dimensionality and so on is that of the span of a set of vectors. Okay. A set of linear, a set of vectors in a linear vector space is said to span the space if every vector can be written as a linear combination of these vectors. So again let me say phi 1 phi n span the linear vector space V if and only if uh, any vector in V can be written as a linear combination so this is the idea behind a set of vectors spanning the space any vector in that space should be writable as a linear combination of these given vectors and then this set of vectors spans the space. These are independent concepts. One should not confuse one for the other. For example, in ordinary Euclidean space, three dimensional Euclidean space, uh, Ex, Ey unit vectors in the x and y directions, they are linearly independent of each other because Ex is certainly not a multiple of Ey. Uh, these vectors. E x, E y, so these are linearly independent. E x, E y, E z, they span the space and are also linearly independent. No one of them can be written as a linear combination of the other two. So they are both linearly independent as well as they span the space. Here is a set E x, E y, E z, E x plus E y. Does this set span the space? Yes, indeed. Is it linearly independent? Yeah. No. So you could have a set of vectors which span the space but are not linearly independent. You could have a set of vectors which are linearly independent but they do not span the space. This set not a span, not a span, do not span. R 3 
they do not span the usual three dimensional vector space. This is both uh, they span R3 as well as linearly independent. This set of vectors is span R3 but not linearly independent of each other. How about this set E x E y plus E x E z plus E y plus E x. Do they span the space? Yes, they do. Are they linearly independent? Yes, they are also linearly independent of each other. No vector can be written uniquely, it can be written as a linear combination of the others. Part of this vector has got is here, but not all of it. So, these guys also they span R3 and linearly independent. What is the difference between this set and this set here? They both span R3 and they are both linearly independent. One set is orthogonal and the other set is not orthogonal. It is like choosing oblique coordinates in three dimensions. This is like saying I choose the x axis, then this vector here, which is a 45 degree line in the x y plane, and then this fellow here, which is at an angle to the x y z axis. I choose those three, this sort of set of axes. You can always do that, they are oblique axes, but they are not orthogonal to each other. So, it is possible to have a set of vectors which span the vector space and are linearly independent, but are not orthogonal. There is another difference between these vectors and those vectors. This is not an orthogonal set of vectors, they are not mutually perpendicular to each other, their scalar products are not 0, but there is another difference between this set and that set and what is that? They are not normalized. The magnitude of this vector is not 1 or this vector is not 1. Okay. Of course, you can normalize these vectors trivially when I write uh, root 2. This will normalize it right away and uh, this This is again normalized, but it is not orthogonal. They are normal, but I mean they are normalized to unity, but they are not orthogonal. Now, if they were both normal, normalized to unity each of them and orthogonal, then that would be like a Cartesian basis. This would be very, very useful. So, a set of vectors that are linearly independent and span the LVS forms a basis of the basis set. So, whenever I say here is a set of vectors that forms a basis in this vector space. I mean a set of vectors that both spans the space, every vector is covered, I mean can be written as a linear combination of these fellows and they also are linearly independent of each other. So, both are needed and I just showed you that these are not the same property, they could be mutually exclusive in some sense, they could be examples where they ex one excludes the other. So, linear independence does not imply span and span does not imply linear independence. You need both of them in order to form a basis. If in addition the basis consists of mutually orthogonal vectors whose uh, scalar products of different vectors 0 and each of them has magnitude 1, then we call it an orthonormal basis. orthonormal basis would be each vector has magnitude unity and different vectors from the basis set have 0 scalar products. So, I would write this saying phi i phi j equal to delta i j. Now, I go to abstract notation these are the inner products and if the inner products are 0 if i is not equal to j and equal to 1 if i equal to j. So, the magnitude of the vector is unity 
then I say it is an orthonormal basis. I will very frequently use orthonormal basis sets, but you do not have to have it, you can always have other kinds of basis. We need to ask how many such vectors are needed. The number of vectors in the basis in a basis set in a linear vector space is called the dimensionality of the space and that is unique. For example, in three dimensional Euclidean space you need three mutually you need three linearly independent vectors which span the space in order to form a basis. That basis is not unique this could be a basis that could be a basis. This one is not an orthogonal basis this one is but the number is 3 in each case okay. So that gives you the concept of dimensionality of the linear vector space. And the statement we are going to make is that you can always find given a non orthogonal basis we can always make it an orthogonal basis in the construction which I will show just now. But this number is fixed for every linear vector space. If it turns out that you do not have a finite basis for any n there are vectors which are not in the span of the vectors which are already written down then you say the space has infinite dimension. So an infinite dimensional space is one which does not have a finite basis set. Is R2 a infinite dimensional linear vector space? No, there are infinite number of vectors in R2, but every one of them can be written in terms of as a linear combination of two non co non collinear vectors. So that is a finite vector space, two dimensional, Rn is n dimensional, and if you cannot find a finite basis set, no matter how large n is, then you say the space is infinite dimensional. It is like having a space with an infinite number of directions, independent directions. Yeah. So the vector space containing both element 0 is it infinite dimension? Just an element 0, why should it be infinite dimension? Why? Just has one element, that is it, is a trivial example, right? What do you do with it? Is it a finite dimensional or infinite? No, it is just one vector, that is it. With what? If you have just one vector, but no, you all always have to define multiplication by a scalar, isn't it? So his question is: I take zero, a null vector. I take a null vector. Uh, huh? vector just, uh, just a null vector. Uh, what do you do with that? Uh, That's it. Huh? Oh, why should? With this, yeah. With yeah. Why not? Yeah, that's, I, it's, it's, I don't get this fully. It's a trivial example, right? I mean, if you look at R one, you have only one uh, basis. The basis consists of one vector, just e x. So if you look at, uh, let's look at R one. E x forms a basis. That's it, because any vector in R one can be written as a number times e x, positive or negative. That's a linear space but it has only one independent direction the x axis so that is a rather trivial space it is a one dimensional space but we are now talking about an infinite dimensional space okay. then you got to be a little careful it is not obvious that all the things that you do for ordinary linear vector spaces would work in an infinite dimensional space here is what can go wrong. So let us look at Rn and try to make it R infinity by simply increasing the number of uh, entries. So 
any element of R n, you could write it in the form x 1, x 2, x n. And then I ask, uh, so this is equal to say phi. Then I ask, what is phi with phi? This is equal to the norm of the vector squared by definition. And that is equal to a summation from i equal to 1 to infinity, uh, 1 to n x i mod squared. If the x's are all real, real vector space, then this guy is just x i squared. This is the sum of the, this is the square of the length of the vector in n dimensional vector uh, Euclidean space say. Right? Now of course I would like to make this infinite, but then there is no guarantee this converges. I would like to have vectors of finite length, right. So this is not at all clear that this will converge when n goes to infinity, not clear at all. And if it does not converge this does not make sense when you add two infinities you get another infinity and so on. So you have to put in a condition that the vectors have finite length. To do that you would have to say that in R infinity namely the space of sequences x1, x2, x3 up to xn where n tends to infinity should be such that this quantity converges when n tends to infinity. So you require then that you have a space in which i equal to 1 to infinity xi mod squared is less than infinity, it is finite. Then we can speak of a respectable vector space of infinite dimensions with denumerable components x1, x2, x3, x4 all the way to infinity. But you require that this be finite. It is a simple matter to prove that this is needed in order for the triangle inequality to be valid, in order for the Cauchy Schwartz condition to be valid and so on. So this is required and this space has a special name. This is the linear vector space of square summable sequences and it is denoted by L2. Then the triangle inequality is valid and so on and so forth. So is this an element of uh, L2, uh, x1, x2, etc. is such that uh, equal to say let us start with 1, uh, 1 over root 2, 1 over root 3, 1 over root 4. Is this an L2, little L2? Because if I sum this, I square it first and sum it, it is 1 plus a half plus one third plus one fourth and so on and of course this series, a harmonic series, it diverges, it is infinite. So this is not an L2, this is not an element of L2. How about this? How about if I had – is that an L2? How about if uh, x i or x r say is equal to 1 over r to the power epsilon, some epsilon, some positive number epsilon. When is it in L2? Epsilon greater than half uh, because then when you square it you get 1 over 2 epsilon and that number 2 epsilon must be greater than 1 for it to converge. The series 1 over n does diverges, 1 over n to the power 1 plus point you know 0, 0, 0, whatever it is, anything it converges definitely. So epsilon uh, in L2 if epsilon is greater than half, any positive number greater than half it is a convergent. And of course you can play this game and uh, what happens if uh, you have uh, xn equal to log n over n to the power um, uh, 0.6, what happens here? Is this going to be in L2?
remember in the denominator you get when you square you get n to the power 1.2 that is greater than 1. So, if you did not have a numerator it would of course converge, but you have a log on top and log infinity of course is infinite. So, is this convergent? Yeah, it is a, right. I mean, all of calculus can be summarized in one line. The log is weaker than a power, and the power is weaker than an exponential. So, certainly this converges. So, this is very much in L2. How about this? Yeah, no matter what you raise it to, it does not matter, it is still going to work. So, this is the kind of thing. A simple matter all you have to do a test is the convergence of these guys and then once it is valid this is true. Now, we are going to use square summable sequences L2 and one of the reasons for doing so is that you can actually generalize this. You could ask why do I have to do this? Why do I have to define norm in this fashion at all? I could define norm in a slightly different way. I could for example, instead of writing the norm of a vector as equal to this to the power a half which is what the norm would be because the square of it is this. I could really do this. I could put a p here and put a 1 over p where p is some positive number. I can define a norm of this kind. This would be this if, if it goes to infinity if n goes to infinity this would be L subscript p. Actually I should probably write subscript 1 over p or something like that depends on the notation but I could use something like this. But the disadvantage is that the advantage of L2 is that it is self dual. The dual space is also the space of square summable sequences, but the space LP is not self dual. The dual to LP, LP dual is LQ where 1 over p plus 1 over q equal to half. Am I, am I making sense here? Uh, L2 equal to 1. Equal to 1. Equal to 1. Okay. So, if you improve in p you go, go down in q and so on and so forth. So, only the only one which is self dual there is when p equal to q equal to 2. Okay. So, we will restrict our attention to L2 square summable sequences and there is another physical reason for it because in quantum mechanics you are going to give a probability interpretation to the various you know products and so on and they naturally involve L2 in a natural way. So, what appears there naturally is L2. So, we are not going to do the theory of L LP uh, sequences which are P summable or something, just square summable sequences. Okay. So, we can define an infinite dimensional space in this form and now let us ask what the idea of a base, what the advantage of doing a base, uh, writing a basis is. First let me show you that if you start with an arbitrary basis which is not orthonormal you can make it orthonormal always. That is like starting with oblique coordinates in two dimensions, three dimensions etcetera and then saying I am going to make it an orthogonal set. Uh, what do you do in a plane for example? If you are stuck with the oblique coordinates, if in a plane somebody comes along and gives you this unit vector and that vector and says I insist on using these oblique coordinates, the way you would make it orthogonal is to say all right I will choose the first fellow and call that the unit vector in the one direction and then I take the second vector I project it down to this direction here and then I get rid of this part of it which is already included in the first direction and I use this direction as the orthogonal vector and then I normalize it suitably. So, this procedure if you can do this systematically starting with the first vector, second vector etcetera is called Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization. And it says suppose you are given with psi 1 to start with the first vector and then you choose a phi 1 
equal to psi 1 divided by the norm of psi 1. In other words, you normalize this vector by dividing by its norm. Hmm? Then I remember that this is equal to psi 1 divided by psi 1, psi 1 to the power half. So, first you normalize it. This guarantees that the inner product of phi 1 with itself is unity. Then you take the second vector psi 2 and you write this and take psi 2 and you subtract from this psi 2 the portion of psi 2 that is along phi 1 and what would that be? It would be this phi 1 this is the on the left hand side you do a dot product with phi 1 uh, sorry. But, uh, yeah, that is okay. Phi 1 with psi 2 on this side, you subtract this portion out. So, this gets rid of the uh, phi 1, it has to be a vector. So, this is just the component, and that is the vector here, and then you normalize the whole thing. So, call this something or the other divided by the norm of this. That ensures that this vector, which I now call phi 2, is normalized to unity and moreover is orthogonal to phi 1. So, this will guarantee that phi 1 phi 1 equal to 1 equal to phi 2 phi 2 and moreover phi 1 phi 2 equal to 0. That is guaranteed. Now once I got phi 1 and phi 2, I take psi 3 and I subtract from it the component of psi 3 along both phi 1 and phi 2 and then I normalize the whole thing. So, in this systematic way, I end up with a set of vectors phi 1, phi 2, etcetera, which would really be the original vectors psi 1, psi 2 and so on with portions subtracted such that it forms an ortho orthogonal orthonormal basis. So, this is uh, algebraically it looks complicated to write the next step down, but it is a trivial procedure. Notice what has gone on here in this uh, case. What I did was to say psi 2 is a vector. So, here was psi 1 symbolically and I said oh this has some arbitrary length. So, I divide by its norm and then I created this vector, this vector this is phi 1 by dividing by its length. So, it is a unit vector now and then I had a psi 2 this was psi 2 and I took the dot product of psi 2 by hitting with psi 1 phi 1 on the left hand side that essentially is this portion and I subtracted that out. So, what was left was this vector and then I normalize that vector to unity. So, this became phi 2 and so on. Okay. So, this is all I did in this orthogonalization procedure, but what you have to note is that to remove the portion of this vector along the vector phi 1, what I did was to take a dot product with phi 1 on the left hand side and then I multiply by the unit vector phi 1 here. So, what I have tacitly done is to use the fact that if you give me any vector psi and I take any other vector phi then this any other unit vector phi then this object this object here applied to this vector psi from the left projects that portion of psi which is along the unit vector phi. So, this guy here if I act on the vector psi on the right hand side this is nothing but phi phi psi because you do not need two lines here there is nothing in between. So, that is the beauty of this notation this guy here is just a complex number 
you can move it to the left or right it does not matter this is a vector though a ket vector. So, this is the same as phi psi theta phi here. So, it is a coefficient multiplied by a vector unit vector there. Yeah. No, it does not matter because this is not true psi phi is not equal to phi psi this is not true it is a complex conjugate. Ah, the order of this guy and this guy here. Oh, you mean in the in the orthonormalization procedure? I could have started with any one of the vectors as the first one, and chosen anything else as the second one, anything else as the third one. It doesn't matter. Hmm. In which step? Here or there? Yes. No, the question is what you are given. It's a matter of you know, uh, it's a matter of stating what you are given. So let me write that down. Given a set psi one, psi two, etc. Given this set, I call them psi one, psi two, etc. I would like to create an orthonormal set, and I call that set phi one, phi two, etc. So it's a question of what you are given and what the output is. What I am given is a set of vectors which are not perpendicular to each other. What I am creating is a set which is perpendicular to each other. The former I call psi just for convenience and the latter I call phi. I will continue to use phi as far as possible for orthonormal basis sets. And the reason is I am going to use this symbol psi for arbitrary state vectors of quantum mechanical systems. So I do not want to confuse it with basis vectors. It is like it is a matter of convention after all I use e sub x, e sub y, e sub z and so on for unit vectors in Cartesian space I could have used some other symbol. But uh, the point I made here was that these objects are different objects this guy should be identified with a column vector of some kind this is not a column vector this object is a complex number. It is just a number a 1 by 1 matrix if you like this is a column vector and whether you write column vector times number or number times column vector does not matter and therefore I moved it here because normally you would write 3 times i plus 4 times j plus 6 times k for a 3 dimensional vector right you would not write i times 3 plus j times 4 it is just a matter of notation. On the other hand if I identify this with a column vector and this with a row vector this multiplication here is column on the left row on the right. So what sort of object is this it is a matrix because if this is represented by a column vector huh, with n rows and one column then this guy here is an n by 1 matrix there is n rows and one column. This fellow here on the other hand is a 1 by n and this guy here is n times 1. So this is an n by n object this goes away and it is an n by n matrix and it acts on a column vector to produce a column vector once again on the left. So objects of this kind objects of this kind are to be identified with operators they act on vectors and produce other vectors. So this gives us our first introduction to the very important idea that in a linear vector space you have in addition to the vectors you have another set of objects called operators and these operators would act on the vectors and produce other vectors and a good way of remembering this notation how beautiful it is is ket vectors are like column vectors bra vectors are like row vectors and if you put a bra on the left and a ket on the right you get a number but if you put 
the ket on the left and the bra on the right you get an operator. Okay. Now of course it does in a given linear vector space even this is an operator psi 1 psi 2 it does not have to be the same on both, the, both things in a given vector space with a certain dimensionality you have to take a ket vector and take a bra vector the spaces are the same dimensions and therefore this is an object n by n object for example like a matrix. So such quantities are operators but in the special case in which psi 1 is equal to psi 2 equal to phi in this fashion this operator is a very special operator because if you have a ket vector and the same bra vector on this side then when it acts on other ket vectors it projects out the portion of that ket vector along this ket vector. So it is called a projection operator. Okay. So this object here this object phi n phi n is a projection okay. that is what you do when you take an arbitrary vector in three dimensional space so let me write it in terms of i j k which is very familiar to you if I have v equal to 3 i plus 4 j plus 6 k for example some ordinary Euclidean three dimensional space how do I find this coefficient. So let me call it a 1 or v 1 v 2 and v 3 how do I find v 1 what do I do I project I dot I dot with what with i because I know there is an orthonormal basis. So i dot j is 0 i dot k is 0 and what I am really doing is to take i dot v on the left hand side and that is guaranteed to give me v1 in abstract notation the same thing would look like some vector psi equal to say v1 phi1 plus v2 phi 2 plus v 3 phi 3 and I want to find out what is v 1 here and I am given the orthonormality relation phi i phi j equal to delta i j and given that relation this is an orthonormal basis for instance then to find this v 1 I have to take the dot scalar product with phi 1 on this side here. So if I do that phi 1 psi equal to v1 is guaranteed to be v1 because phi1 is phi2 is 0 phi1 is phi3 is 0. But if I want to produce this whole thing with the phi normally we are used to calling components of vectors vectors themselves that is not true I should really not say v1 v2 v3 are components of this vector because component means part and the parts of a vector can only be vectors. So really I should call this the one component this the two component and that the three component I should really call this together with this. So what I do for that is to really apply on the left here I do not dot with phi on the left but I do this phi 1 phi 1 acting on this vector psi since there is nothing in between you could just as well have a single line and write psi here and what does this give you? Well when phi 1 hits this it gives you a 1 when it hits this or that it gives you a 0 so you are left with v1 and there is this still here so you really have phi 1 v1 which is the same as v1 phi 1 it is a trivial notation I am just belaboring a point a very trivial point but it is good to get the notation straightened out. So the projection operator is this this guy projected the portion here in three dimensional vector space very often in addition to a dot product and a cross product in the old days they used to define quantities called dyadics or tensor products. So they would actually write this i i 
as a projection operator and the idea is that if you took i i and dotted with v on this side, so vector from both sides. So, you can dot on the right or dot on the left and you dot on the right and this fellow becomes a number and you get v 1 and this will give you v 1 i in this fashion. So, this used to be called a dyadic, a dyad, a dyadic. or tensor product and of course, you immediately see that once I take up a vector and project along all directions, I have got the vector itself. So, it is immediately obvious that this fellow is a projection operator and it has the following properties. It is clear that phi n, so if I call this p n equal to this, then what is p n squared? It says apply the operator twice. Once you take a vector and you project along the x axis, you project again you are just going to get nothing new, it is going to be itself right, you have already finished projecting. So, what is p n squared? It should be p n itself and indeed that is true because all you have to do is to write it twice together phi n phi n and then you write it again phi n phi n here and this is of course unity. So, you again back to phi n phi n and this is equal to p n. What happens if you took, you had a basis, these phi is formed an orthonormal basis in your linear vector space and you took a summation over n phi n, phi. what do you get now? Acting on any vector, it is going to produce a sum of all the components of this vector. In other words, it is going to produce the vector itself. So, this is equal to the unit operator. or the unit operator is something which when you apply to a vector gives you the reproduces the vector does not it. In one of our famous textbooks this is written in a big way by saying the unit operator is something which when acting on a vector does nothing at all. That statement does not do anything to me either so it <laughs> just means when you add all the projectors you get one when I mean you get the, you get the vector back again. But uh, this is a non trivial property a very non trivial property and an interesting property which is we will also see that it has got one more property namely this thing here is a self adjoint operator we will come to that. But meanwhile you can already see that this operator has is going to have interesting properties. So for example, I have p n squared into uh, sorry. So p n uh, p n squared is p n. So p n p n minus the unit operator equal to 0. That is just rewriting the equation p n squared is p n. These are operators. So, I will be very careful and use the unit operator here. Okay. Now, what does that suggest to you? What is that uh, statement? Imagine p n is in an, some finite dimensional vector space and then this guy here is a matrix and says this matrix squared is equal to the matrix itself. What do you call such a matrix? idempotent right its power is equal to itself you square it you get itself what can you say about the eigen values of such a matrix well this is like acting like some minimal polynomial of this matrix right so it's really saying the eigen values are 0 and 1 so eigen values of projection operators are 0 or 1 okay we'll have to prove that more correctly but it's already here this this fellow is already saying that the eigen values are either 0 or 1 and the square it is an idempotent operator of course and moreover it satisfies this relation. So, we are going to use two very crucial properties of orthonormal basis in linear vector spaces and the first one is orthonormality of course. I call this orthonormality. And the second one, which is a different story altogether, it is a different relation. This is a sum of numbers here, this number is equal to either 1 or 0, 
this is a set of operators projection operators and this is called completeness. These are different properties, you should not confuse one for the other. Uh, uh, let us let us let me give an example of it which is non trivial. What does uh, for example, let us look at a two dimensional linear vector space, this is an ordinary plane. Now, in this two dimensional vector space, I would like to represent the unit vectors along the x and y directions by column vectors. So, it is clear that uh, phi 1 in this case is what you would call the unit vector i is represented in this fashion 1 0. This is a representation on the right hand side, this is the abstract vector you should not confuse the person for the dress in some sense, but very often we use these interchangeably. This is a representation, there are other ways of representing things the, these vectors, but here is a convenient representation in a two dimensional space. The natural thing to do is to use column vectors with two rows and one column. Then phi 2 equal to 0 1, that is the y direction. It is immediately clear that phi 1 inner product with phi 2 is 0 straight away and that phi 1 with phi 1 is 1, this is very clear. So, phi i, so this is satisfied right away. Now, let us ask what the projectors look like, what does this look like? This has to be a matrix, it has to be a matrix. So, what does it look like? You have to take this guy, so you write 1 0 and then you have to take this fellow here which is equal to 1 0 on the right hand side in this fashion and what is this matrix? This is 1, you have row by column rule, this is row and this column there is nothing left and then a row by column, so it is a 0, a 0 and a 0. So that is the first of these and there are four of these guys in this space, you can have phi 2 with phi 2 then phi 2, so immediately you see that phi 2 with phi 2 is equal to 0, 0, 0, 1 here. So is this satisfied or not? Yes indeed because it is this matrix plus that matrix that is the unit matrix, so that is immediately satisfied. So, it satisfies this and it satisfies this, but there is more to it. You can also ask what is phi 1 with phi 2, what is this equal to? That 2 is a 2 by 2 matrix or an operator of some kind, it is not a projection operator, but it is an operator. So, what does this give you? It is equal to 1 0 but then you got to do a 0 1 here and this is equal to the first one is going to give you 0, the second one is going to give you a 1 and then a 0 and a 0 here and finally if you did it the other way phi 2 with phi 1 this is going to give you a 0 0 1 and a 0 here. So, what have I achieved by this? So, this shows now you know that any 2 by 2 matrix in the natural basis, this is called the natural basis. Any 2 by 2 matrix, if I write A, B, C, D in the linear space, two dimensional linear space in which this is an orthonormal basis in that space this represents an operator because it acts on column vectors and produces other column vectors. So, it is an operator a general operator, 
but this general operator is actually shorthand this is shorthand for a times 1 0 0 0 plus b times 0 1 0 0 plus c times 0 0 1 0 plus d times 0 0 0 1 it is shorthand for that that is what you mean when I write a b c d hmm? agreed that is what I mean when I write a matrix this is what I mean. So, it is clear that these four matrices are forming a basis in the space of operators, operators which act on the vectors of your original two dimensional linear vector space. But what are these four guys? This is equal to A times phi 1, phi 1 plus. In fact, let me not write uh, A, B, C, D, let us write A 1 1, this is a better language. A 1 2, A 2 1, A 2 2 that is equal to some operator A which I represent in this form. So, it is A 1 1 plus A 1 2 plus A 2 1 plus A 2 2. So, this is A 1 1 5 1 5 1 plus A 1 2 5 1 5 2 plus A 2 1 phi 2 phi 1 plus a 2 2 phi 2 phi 2. In a slight abuse of notation this is this is an explicit matrix representation and these are abstract operators I have represented them chosen to represent them by these 2 by 2 matrices. So, this is what it means it means that you could take when you provide a basis in a linear vector space when I provide a basis of this kind an orthonormal basis not only can I write every vector as a linear combination of these unit vectors, but I can also represent operators on these vectors in a natural basis which is the set phi i phi j. just as the set of vectors phi i or phi j the ket vectors form a basis in the space the set of operators ket phi i bra phi j where i and j run over all the possible values they form a basis for expanding operators and that is what I have done here. And now you begin to see why a 1 1 is called a matrix element the reason is you could write this term as phi 1 a 1 1 phi 1 you could write it like that because this is a ket vector and a bra this is just a number. So, it does not do anything you can move it around wherever you like. How do I find a 1 1 given this how do I find a 1 1. given an arbitrary vector psi the way I find its component along any of the unit directions is to do project is to use the projection operator. So, what do I do to find a 1 1 what is this a 1 1 it is nothing but this quantity is nothing but phi 1 a phi 1 that is what it is because if I put a phi 1 here and then a phi 1 there on the other side this is precisely what it is right. This quantity here is precisely what, what this a 1 1 means So, if I want to find a 1 1 from this relation I do ket phi 1 on the right that kills this I do bra phi 1 on the left that kills this because phi 1 with phi 1 is 1 and you get a 1 1 then phi 2 with phi 1 is 0. So, that goes away this one is 0 because phi 1 with phi 2 is 0 and here both are 0. So, now we begin to see that this notation is so beautiful that ket vectors represent vectors in the space bra vectors represent vectors in the dual space 
A brow on the left, a cat on the right is an inner product, it is a complex number. A cat on the left, a brow on the right is a operator. The basis in the linear vector space also provides a basis for operators in this space. And finally, objects like this are the matrix elements. Ket vector operator on the left that gives you some other ket vector with this bra vector here that is a number complex number. So, these quantities are called matrix elements. because that is exactly what they are and I will continue to use the word matrix element even when the vector space is infinite dimensional and these operators they are not matrix operators they may be differential operators, integral operators, integral differential operators anything at all anything at all but I will continue to call it a, a matrix element. We are going to look at spaces where the number of dimensions where it is not only infinite dimensional but continuously infinite dimensional. So, you cannot even label it as 1, 2, 3, 4 up to infinity but it just goes on continuously. So, the concepts are not very hard to generalize we will do that we will care, be careful of some technicalities like we were about L2 and so on but I would I would continue to use these objects as matrix elements. Now, when we come to the postulates of quantum mechanics then we will see that objects like this are measurable quantities these are the measured values these are the things that you would get to make actual physical measurements. So, it is important to recognize what sort of objects we have here. So, uh, the third lesson is right in here so, let us write this given an orthonormal basis I. You first have this, then you have completeness, and then you also find that uh, any vector psi can be expanded uniquely. summation over n some coefficients let us write C n uniquely that is the beauty of these orthonormal bases that once you make an expansion then the set of numbers C n uniquely specifies the vector psi and vice versa. Pardon me ah fine sorry. And finally, any operator k in the space, just as any vector can be expanded in the form a equal to a summation over n comma m a n m. n by n and these are called the matrix elements of this abstract operator. So, this set forms a basis this set of vectors forms with all n and m forms a basis of course, when n is equal to m these are the diagonal matrix elements and when n is not equal to m there is a off diagonal elements this matrix. There is no guarantee here that every matrix can be written as a diagonal form or anything it is irrelevant completely irrelevant okay. We will talk about eigenvalues of operators and so on very shortly, but this is this is the basic mathematical framework that you need. Okay. We need a few more important concepts such as what is meant by a Hermitian conjugate and that joint and so on we will talk about that next time. But I want to impress upon you very firmly the fact that uh, this machinery once you have laid it down it is almost automatic which is almost self correcting this notation is absolutely completely self correcting almost 
very very useful would be this relation. When I have complicated products of operators whose elements I want to find, I would insert this in between because you insert the unit operator every now and then and you have not done anything. But then the point is it reduces this product that you have to simpler products you can compute very easily. So completeness is a very useful relation orthonormality of course so it is always. The next thing I want to do is to talk about function spaces and I will do that tomorrow. Yeah.